Good afternoon and uh, welcome. My name is uh, Nick Robbins. I'm a professor in practice uh, for sustainable finance at the Grantham Research Institute at uh, the London School of Economics. It's my pleasure really to welcome you to the uh, launch of our new report, Climate Neutral Central Banking, how the European system of central banks can support the transition to net zero. I'm delighted to be a co-author of this report along with Simon Decau, uh, my colleague at the LSE, and also Uli Volz, who is the uh, director of the SOAS Centre for Sustainable Finance at the University of London. In a few minutes, uh, Simon and Uli will present to you uh, the key findings and the recommendations of that uh, report. I'm also really pleased uh, to introduce three leaders uh, in climate action and central banking who will give their their views and their, their, their views on the report and the way ahead. So firstly, I'd like to welcome Soledad Nunes, a member of the Governing Council and Executive Commission of uh, Banco de España. Welcome, uh, Soledad. Um, then uh, Dirk Schoenmacher, who is a Professor of Banking and Finance at the Rotterdam School of Management at the Erasmus University, Rosanne. And then uh, Laurence Tubiana, CEO of the uh, European Climate Foundation, and also Chair of the Board of Directors of uh, Agence Française pour le Développement. Uh, and of course, Laurence uh, was also uh, France's Climate Change Ambassador and Special Representative um, uh, for the Paris Climate um, uh, com Conference in 2015, and is really recognised as one of the key actors architects of that uh, Paris uh, uh, agreement. Um, we will have, as I say, um, a, a brief presentation of the key findings. Um, uh, we'll then have the, 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 the thoughts from our three distinguished respondents, uh, and then we'll really have an, an opportunity for you uh, to ask your comments, uh, and please use the uh, Q&A function uh, for that, and we'll try and answer as many of the uh, questions as, as possible. So clearly, um, 2021 is a really big year in terms of making a, a green and inclusive recovery from COVID a, a reality and making the irreversible shift to a net zero and res resilient uh, economy. Um, clearly, greening the financial system is essential to make this happen. And as well as efforts from banks and investors and insurers and uh, financial consumers and civil society, uh, it's really remarkable, I think, uh, to see the increasing engagement from central banks and supervisors over the last uh, year, really unprecedented uh, engagement, which I think we've seen uh, on display at the recent Green Swan conference. Uh, so I think a remarkable uh, shift. We are in a race, a race to net zero and to net zero finance. And our theme for today is how can the central banks uh, within the European Union, the European system of central banks, notably uh, the ECB and also the member state central banks, how can they best support the EU's position of achieving a climate neutral economy by, uh, by mid-century. Clearly, this is very timely. Uh, we have the ECB review underway, and we obviously have the COP26 uh, marker uh, later this year. So really uh, timely discussion, hopefully. And without further ado, I'd like to hand over to uh, Simon Uli to take us through the report's uh, findings and recommendations. Simon, over to you. Um, yes, thank you, Nick. So um, I would like to to walk you quickly through the through the overall rationale for climate neutral central banking in the EU, and I will then hand over to to Uli for yeah for our recommendations. So these are our two reports on net zero central banking. The first one here in the back was published in March, and this is essentially the high level narrative setting report. That, that discusses the rationale for alignment in the, inter, in the international context. And the second one, which is the one we are launching today, presents the EU application of our, um, yeah, of our key arguments and, and recommendations. So um, yes, the science. To start with, with what is very clear to all of us, achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions is a, is a central goal of, of climate policy. And in order to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, global emissions need to reach net zero around, around 2050. In terms of policy, so the, in, in total, um, around 127 countries, must be more by now, responsible for around 63% of emissions are considering net zero targets, and quite a few have also legally adopted them already. Then there is the financial sector. And well, finance is of course critical in achieving this transition and across the financial system, a small but growing number of, of, of banks and investors are committing to align their portfolios and they have committed assets worth many trillions to, to net zero by, by 2050. 
And then, um, yeah, this brings us to, to central banks and supervisors. And so the, the starting point for our thinking was that, that when we started to work on this project a year ago, the, um, the observation that central banks in some sense were missing from this, from this race to net zero. However, and, and, and we will discuss this on the, on the next slides, it's very clear now that there is some emerging net zero consistent thinking among, among central banks. Um, yes, so this is where we are uh, in, terms of, in terms of action and thinking. I think European central banks as well as supervisors have become very involved in, in responding to, to, well, mostly the financial stability implications of climate change. And they have also been very clear that this is in line with their, with their current mandates. However, the issue is that most of the past and also still the current action was or is framed without a clear positioning on, on the EU's climate neutrality objective. But this is important. We are starting to see some emerging net zero, um, net zero aligned thinking. So for example, there has been this, this updated uh, Bank of England remit letter asking the Bank of England to align its, its operation with, with the net zero transition as a, as a government priority. Then um, the ECB, well, at the ECB, there is this uh, mandate and alignment question, which is now being discussed very openly by, by executive board members. And, and um, well, the NGFS is also doing very important work in this area. So in a, in, a, in a recent report on monetary policy, the NGFS discussed how to ensure that central bank operations do not undermine this transition to a, to a low carbon economy. Then last week, the NGFS published its, its latest set of reference scenarios, which are also increasingly connected to net zero by to, to the net zero by 2050 target. And then Nick mentioned in the beginning, there was this recent um, BIS Greens Bond conference where a lot of central bankers also discussed net zero and the, and the potential implications. Um, yes, so why should central banks and financial supervisors act on net zero? Well, first, macroeconomic and financial stability. So net zero can be seen as the best way of minimizing the risks of climate change to the stability of the financial system and also the, um, the macro economy. And then we would, yeah, we would argue that, that central banks have a role in ensuring that the financial sector aligns with, with net zero targets, which would then also accelerate the transition in the real economy and so this is this the essential point here, help to avoid macroeconomic and financial instability in the future. Um, the second point is policy coherence. So the argument here is that, that central banks and supervisors need to ensure that their activities are aligned or coherent with, with net zero government policy. And relevant in this context is the secondary mandate of many central banks to support the economic policies or priorities of their governments which may now include, include well, net zero or, or climate neutrality targets. Um, just to illustrate the urgency in the EU for this, um, for this transition, so the Commission has, has set out these, these, ambitious, these ambitious targets that will necessitate a very quick phasing out of investment in carbon intensive activities in, in order to somehow achieve climate neutrality by 2050. And this will require, well, a large scale structural change in which a lot of these carbon intensive industries that, that, that you see in figure one here will have to decline very rapidly. Um, yes, so why should European central banks care about climate neutrality and how does, does net zero relate to their, to their mandated objectives? I guess this is, this is the crucial question here for us. Um, the starting point for all of this has been, has been for this net zero debate has been the green, the green Deal. And the European Commission has proposed the first European climate law, which would then make the climate neutrality objective legally binding. Then there's also the EU action plan on, on, on financing sustainable growth. And all of this has implications for the ECB and the European system of central banking. So the treaty sets out that the ECB shall support the general economic policies in the Union. Um, this is Article 127 of the treaty. And, and this has now started a very interesting debate about ensuring policy coherence between the, e the ESCB operations and the EU climate neutrality objective. And um, yes, so our, our case for action here, um, we have several points. First, financial stability. This is the uncontroversial one. This is where a lot of central banks are very active already. Then price stability. This is also very much on the agenda of the ECB and its, its, its current strategy review. 
then policy coherence so this is what i just outlined and where the debate is i would argue well happening right now at the at the ecb and for example um executive board members frank elderson and isabel schnabel have very prominently discussed this in in in, in recent weeks at a podcast and in different speeches and then there's also market neutrality, which is an important convention for the ECB and the, and the European Central Banks, and which, yeah, which needs to be rethought in light of, of, of the alignment with climate neutrality. And with this, I would like to hand over to, to Uli for, for our seven recommendations. Yeah, thanks a lot, Simon, and hello, everyone. Uh, really great pleasure to, to be with you. So uh, in our report, we argue that, that uh, the European system of central banks with the ECB at the helm really needs to take a very comprehensive approach. Um, it's clear, it's an imperative that we align the financial system across uh, the European Union with a net zero uh, goal uh, swiftly. And it's clear, as Simon laid out, uh, that there is a very important role for the ECB, the national central banks, and also the, the various uh, supervisory authorities across uh, the union and so we we um, uh, have put down in the report uh, seven uh, different recommendations which we think have to go uh, together so this is not the time now to be tinkering at the margins we really need to have a comprehensive approach um, uh, it has been it has to be sought through uh, uh, consistently uh, if you could please move to the next slide simon Um, if you can click through all, all of them. Uh, so uh, firstly, um, on strategy, uh, we need to have a high level strategy uh, for the European system of central banks um, uh, and they need to develop a climate neutrality roadmap, which really <clears throat> lays out the long-term uh, ambitions of that uh, strategy, but also uh, near-term action. Uh, so that this gives a clear steer for market participants, uh, everyone in the financial system, what to expect. So, so this has to have a guiding function uh, for the entire financial system, but of course also uh, this needs to guide the action of the different uh, institutions in the ESCB uh, and the supervisory world. Um, uh, we also argue that uh, as part of this uh, high-level strategy, the ECB should um, uh, updates its mission statement. So many people actually don't probably don't know that the ECB does have a mission statement, but um, we argue that climate neutrality uh, should become part of it because it really is such an important um, element of, of uh, the ECB's mission going forward. Uh, the second re recommendation is around uh, prudential policy. So that involves the ECB, but of course also uh, the national central banks to the extent that they uh, are responsible for uh, micro and micro prudential uh, policy, but also the other prudential authorities. Um, and uh, a lot has been uh, done already uh, in terms of analyzing financial stability implications of climate change. Now there's a, a need to really move ahead quickly to, to integrate uh, um, uh, climate neutrality into micro and micro prudential uh, uh, tools and instruments. Um, and one um, uh, very concrete suggestion that we are putting forward in our report is that um, all financial institutions uh, uh, in the European Union uh, should be required uh, to submit net zero transition plans where they lay out um, how they will um, achieve uh, their own net zero uh, transition. Um, and these can be then also used for, for regulatory uh, micro macro potential purposes. Uh, the third recommendation is around scenario. Scenario analysis um, has become uh, incredibly important. And um, uh, uh, so um, uh, the uh, monetary financial authorities in the European Union uh, should lay out clear scenarios that can be then used uh, uh, by financial institutions. And these scenarios uh, should include uh, scenarios that are consistent uh, with the uh, climate neutral pathway. Um, and there has been, of course, a lot of work done uh, by the NGFS. And then we've just uh, a few days ago seen, seen the new set of scenarios. So there's a lot to build on. Uh, but that is an important uh, area. And, and that, of course, should also be then extended uh, used for stress testing and so on. 
Uh, next slide, please. The first recommendation about monetary policy. And um, so we argue that the uh, European system of central banks needs to uh, integrate climate neutrality into the monetary frameworks and the models. So the models really need to take that at the baseline uh, assumption and um, uh, the various instruments and, and, and tools need to be um, aligned uh, with the net zero uh, pathway. Um, and uh, so that would include, for example, um, adjusting uh, um, collateral frameworks, uh, but also um, uh, very importantly, uh, asset purchase programs. And that does not mean uh, that the ECB has to conduct green QE, uh, but is about excluding uh, um, uh, assets that are not aligned with this transition uh, pathway. And uh, we've seen a lot of movement on this, uh, including the Bundesbank president, uh, who, who's given a noted speech at the Green Swan conference recently. Um, the fifth recommendation is around portfolio management, um, also an area where a lot has been happening. Um, so all the uh, um, uh, central bank portfolios uh, should be uh, managed according to um, uh, responsible investment principles, um, and they should um, uh, indeed adopt a climate neutrality target. Uh, and that should then also uh, involve publishing um, uh, 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 how these targets are met. The sixth recommendation may be a bit surprising for some. It is about the role of uh, the European Central Banks in facilitating a just transition. Um, so central banks are doing a lot of analysis um, of the macroeconomic developments in the union. Um, and they also have to analyze um, how um, uh, the transition is impacting um, uh, the, the national and regional economies. And this is really important uh, knowledge that can be put to use also for um, government policies. Um, so uh, central banks could be um, uh, stress testing, analyzing uh, downside uh, sectoral and regional risks and, and, and uh, uh, feed these information to uh, uh, policymakers. Um, and then last but not least, we uh, argue that there has to be a, a strong international uh, cooperation component. Climate change obviously is a global challenge. Um, and uh, many European central banks have been leaders already um, in this space. Um, and uh, so we need uh, even more cooperation than we, uh, we have seen so far. Of course, there are different fora, especially the NGFS. Um, but it's important also uh, to, to bring this to the standard setting uh, bodies um, so that the global regulatory framework uh, is being aligned uh, with net zero. Uh, there's also a very important role for uh, important international organizations such as the International Monetary Fund, uh, which uh, has to safeguard the global financial system. And they're also in the uh, uh, monitoring surveillance function of the, the IMF. Um, uh, uh, this needs to be adjusted. Again, quite a lot is happening now. And given that the Europeans have a strong voice at the fund, uh, they should uh, slow their full weight uh, behind these processes. Um, and I would also like to mention that um, uh, European central banks and also supervisors can play a very important role in supporting uh, their counterparts in uh, uh, developing emerging economies, in developing the capacities that, of course, are also now being built up uh, uh, in, 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 in Europe. Um, so um, a lot of central banks across Europe have training centers and, and they can, can uh, uh, run courses, the NGFS is starting uh, to, to work on this now. Um, and of course, there's also an important role for academia, if I may add. Um, uh, next could slide, you, Simon, please. Could you move on, thank you, yes. Yeah. And so now is the time really for implementation. Um, uh, there has been a lot of momentum, uh, but uh, this year uh, really should be a year of action. The COP is coming up. Uh, so it's, it's really the time to, to um, develop all these strategies uh, and move to implementation very swiftly. And again, this is not, not really optional. Uh, Frank Elderson has put it very nicely. You know, the, uh, there is actually um, a, a mandate uh, for, for, for moving ahead with this. 
Um, and central banks and also supervisors clearly have a role to play in complementing, catalyzing and amplifying the net zero policies that the European authorities, the European Parliament, the national governments and so on have put forward. Uh, so these really are key priorities now. Um, and uh, it's clear that central banks alone will not be able to uh, get us through this transition. But it's also clear that uh, we will not be successful in this transition if central banks and supervisors don't play a leading role in guiding financial markets uh, towards net zero. Uh, with this, let me finish. I'm really looking forward to uh, the comments uh, from our distinguished commentators. Thank Wonderful. You. Thanks so much, Simon. Thanks so much, Uli. Lots of uh, good meat there for discussion. And thanks uh, for people who are already putting uh, questions in the Q&A. Uh, please do send your questions through, and after our uh, respondents, we'll, um, we'll start so drawing that in, in a discussion. So thanks very much for setting the scene, um, and we're now going to have uh, sort of feedback and, 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 and thoughts from um, our three respondents. Solid, I, I may turn to you first to give your sort of high-level uh, views on this uh, approach and, and, and some of the recommendations. So Solid, over to you, please. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you uh, for inviting me to, to form part of this panel. And here in these five minutes, what I want to make is some general comments. And afterwards, we can I mean, I can discuss more the, uh, the in more detail the recommendations. And as a general comment, uh, well, also, I also should say that I am here in my opinion, I my own, it's not Banco de España's opinion. Um, uh, my general assessment of, of the report is a very good one. It's very positive. I think it's very clear. It uh, is, uh, explains the reasons why to act in a very clear way and simple, but it's a very complete. The recommendations are uh, very demanding, we have to say, eh? but this is what is needed. Uh, anyway, I have some comments in some of them that, as I said before, uh, but in general, I will support them. And I would like to make two general remarks that I think that Simon, I mean, uh, have made more clear than they are in the, in the presentation. The first one is that we have to recognize, because I think that we have to be positive when you recommend something and to go ahead, you have to be positive of what has been achieved. Eh? And in this sense, I think that central banks has gone a lot, a, 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 big, a huge way from in the in the recent years. I mean, Nick, probably you remember eh, eh, the G20 Green Finance Study Group and the synthesis report. Central banks were. This is 2016. Central banks were not almost not mentioned. I think that the only mention that was made there was that some kind of role for coordination with other regulators, that, that was all. Yeah. And I think that in general, and in particular, uh, European banks have gone from an attitude or position that besides uh, supervision and, and financial stability, all other things is a matter of the governments, it's a policy thing, and I don't have mandate for that. And they have gone from that to well, there is an important role for central banks, but we are not the only game in town. This is a very, I think I have seen this change and this change has been mostly in the last two years. And what, what are the reasons behind this movement? I think that first, because there is, there is a much more decided political commitment through net, uh, net zero, especially in Europe, no? by the parliament, by the European Commission and by the uh, Women Council of the, of, of the European of the EU. And also because I think that as we have learned what are the risks, the awareness has increased. So this is also something that is behind this change of attitude. Right? Uh, the th and the third one probably is that they have realized that advocacy is not enough. I mean, just seeing things and they have to act and to act by uh, with a sample, no? lead, by, lead by a sample. I think these are three important reasons behind this change of attitude. 
Also, something that uh, my second general remark is that uh, um, we have to recognize the challenges. I think that the report does not recognize the challenges so much, specifically. I think that we have to recognize them. I mean, there is a, a data gap, there are model gaps, there is taxonomy gap, there are many gaps, but as uh, it's very important that, I mean, green in central banks, never, nobody said that it's an easy task, but this, I mean, this, this difficulty shouldn't stop them because no action is worse. So that's to make it very clear. I think that something that probably the, the report or, or future report, because this is more general, is, um, I miss is, is sometimes mentioned in the, in the report is that we need to know what net zero plan is. I mean, when, if we are saying net zero plan for central banks or net zero plan for banks, we, we don't know what this exactly is. And if we just use the word net zero, this may, be, may give room for a lot of greenwashing. So I think it's important to uh, define what is that exactly. Um, and something I want to say is that there is, I, in my, from my point of view, there is one missing recommendation. Maybe it's not so sexy, but it's important. And this is that uh, the, the one regarding physical operations and banknotes production and destruction by central banks. I think, I mean, there are uh, at least the uh, Euro, Euro system has some steps towards that. For example, in production, in banknotes production, there is the commitment that for 2023, 100% use of cotton paper. Now the commitment is 75%, but in 2023 will be 100%. On in relation to waste, there will be the prohibition. I think that starting 2022, I think more or less, the prohibition of using land landfills for 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 waste. I mean, they have to go to recycle. Uh, and I think that uh, even if there are these commitments, probably we should recommend central banks to commit to net zero in these tasks eh, and to disclose the footprint in these tasks. I think it's less policy, but I think it's important because it's another thing that, I mean, affects a lot. I mean, it's, this is the second materiality. I mean, it affects the action of the bank, affects the rest of the world too. And um, I think that I will stop here. I don't know if I have uh, spent all my, my time, but let's see for the second round. Thank you very much. Um, I, and, I, and I think really good thoughts are particularly spot on about this net zero transition plan. So I think that's a really good focus for all, all our attention and uh, always good to have another recommendation, particularly in the financial world and digital financial world, something which is about physical things. So I like that a lot. Uh, so thank you, Soledad, and we look forward to uh, engaging in your discussion. Thanks again for the Q&A. Uh, the questions are piling up. Very good. Um, I'd like to turn to you, Laurence, if I may. Um, your thoughts again on the on the report and where this fits in the current, with the current moment we're in, uh, in terms Terms of sort of European uh, climate policy. Thank you. Thank you, Nika. And again, congratulations for that report. It's a very timely one because we need really to make concrete uh, this in a way the, the way to go to the uh, implementation of the net zero goal, which is of course the Paris Agreement goal. And that, of course, because the governance uh, system on climate is so distributed, there is no one decision maker, there's many. And uh, if the objective of net zero doesn't, um, is not owned by every major decision maker, you cannot implement Paris. So that was very, mostly behind the Paris framework. Uh, in a way, elaboration. And, and so it's really important to check that every decision maker owns the net zero and begin to implement it. That said, of course, it's very good that central banks and, and recognizing exactly what Soledad said, the major achievements and in a way the step forward that the central banks in EU have done. 
Uh, but of course now, and, and the good that the recognition that there are the financial stability objective mandates, that's clear, but then there is a secondary mandate on policy coherence and climate, of course, come in. And, and of course, in some jurisdiction, we see that the legal de debate is continuing on whether uh, they can or they cannot have a mandate on climate change. So that's very important to insist and to say there is no other way. And again, following Christine Lagarde's famous work when she was at IMF, if climate is macrocritical, then, then there is a con direct consequences on finance stability as the report is showing. That said, uh, it's the question of the uh, merit order, the link between price stability and the secondary mandate uh, is, is certainly something to dig in more. And, uh, but there is a clear avenue of discussion. And, and again, building on Solidat comment, that would be in a way understanding what the net zero plans are. And my, by the way, it's not only banks or asset owners or asset managers. Uh, or, or, or private banks that has to define that. It's a, uh, the, this issue about what is a pathway to a net zero economy is a very, it's a question mark for every business. And then comes what I think I liked in the, in the report, the idea that we have to check that and to create some kind of accountability mechanism just to understand how this, this mandate now, this fulfilling these objectives can happen. So there is no now, few, uh, in a way, few people ignoring that the need to act on climate is urgent. Uh, and at the same time, we, we see central banks Laurence, you're on mute. Oh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. So I was just having a big discussion <laughs> alone. You do, you, do you hear me now? Do you hear me now? Yes. Very okay. Good. So I was saying, uh, I will make it short then. Um, so I was saying that the, the central banks, uh, that this issue about the, the mandate, which is still open and the report, which is excellent, recognize that discussion. It's very good that across the climate, the climate action, again, it's not only government only, meaning the policymakers, but we need really to, to have the net zero concept embedded in every decision maker uh, action and, and strategy. So, so it's really, it's this question of having to net zero everywhere is important and in a way is a condition for central bankers to understand how they can articulate financial stability with a net zero target and the policy coherence, because of course they cannot operate on void. That of course is, uh, comes to the, my comment that, and I think we can build on the report and develop this even more, that the question of, about the relation between the price stability, the primary mandate of price stability, uh, is connected to uh, a positive duty to support EU climate goals. And uh, that's part of their policy current mandate, and that has to be developed, even if we see that a number of countries and geography, this is not there. So there is a discussion, even by the way, at the board of ECB, as we know it. So because everybody recognizes now mostly that climate action is urgent, uh, central bank are saying, finally, uh, we, we don't have the data, we, we, we lack quality data in many areas. That's why in my muted comment, I said that we need net zero pathway by 2050 or, or, or soon after or earlier that has across the board, uh, asset owners, asset managers, private banks, companies, uh, everybody and, and of course governments and the, and the policy have to display their net zero because if not, of course, I understand the remark of central bankers today to say we, we lack data. That's the other side, but meantime, we cannot just wait to have this that existing data because we, in a way, it's, it's not the first, it will not be the first occasion where central bankers are making decisions under uncertainty. A financial, uh, you don't have a really total predictability, of course, on the financial market. So I don't think it's a totally strong excuse. And by the way, uh, it's really important to that central banks that are displaying their uh, macroeconomic modeling, which is of course a key element of reference for many actors, 
just invest in this new type of modeling that integrate the long term. And, and of course, uh, it's, not the, it's not the way it works now, uh, but I, so uh, the, I, I do think that there is an effort and investment an intellectual and technical investment that central bankers has to do uh, that, um, that can, in a way, uh, make a reference for, and, and I, I, I think these this elements that the net zero uh, uh, have to be developed plans in the report exactly should, in a way, be developed in, 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 even in the macroeconomic modeling. I do think that the idea that uh, central banks should be neutral, should merely follow markets and policymakers, really creates a risk of central bank going missing in action. Uh, as, as Christine uh, Lagarde noted at the Green Swan conference uh, some uh, earlier on. And, and I, I do think this idea that the protection is we don't have the data and we have to be in a way neutral, this finally reinforces the existing situation, this market neutral approach. And that of course reinforces the high carbon status quo of financial markets. And this cannot be prolonged. So. I think, um, of course, how to do that, it's probably something we, we, we could improve in the following research uh, after this launch. Uh, more concrete elements, again, I, I cited the modeling, the, the investment in new type of modeling that integrate the climate risk and the, and the capacity uh, and all the investment infrastructure that is needed to respond to that. Uh, but in a way, that, that because the role of the of the central bankers in orienting the macroeconomic vision, uh, they, I think they, that's part of their duty in a way, even if they, they, they operate into, of course, a data set that is not perfect, but they could push everyone to be serious about displaying their scenarios and checking their scenarios. There is one point I like in the report as well, which is uh, you mentioned that very quickly in the presentation, but this the accountability element. So that there need to be a, a mechanism that we understand what, what, what it is consistent and, and when really what are the actions that makes the mandate consistent with supporting climate policy and, and these net zero scenarios. So um, I, I do think that, of course, central bank supervisor in Europe can require the reporting and disclosure of climate risk data. Of course, that every a lot of discussion on NGFS, and again, as Soledad signaling and really recognizing efforts, but we need to do more than that and, and go for again the the idea of what could be a, a financial stable system. Uh, of course, different and there are different economic structures. So I would say are all different, but that will really. Uh, uh, help uh, uh, the, giving the, the, the framework. I, I do think that will this will help as well to fight the, against the net zero greenwashing, which I see uh, a danger really these days and uh, ensuring that there is, and central bankers of course and regulators have a responsibility in a way in this case, not to in a way induce false expectations and to check that in a way and could play a role, not I have not specific ideas, but could play a role in these accountability mechanisms. So um, I, I do think that uh, uh, the last element I, I would like to mention is um, because the net zero has to be inclusive, as, as the report notes, uh, it's important to use climate stress testing to identify regional and sector hotspot for climate related and particularly employment risk and uh, in particular on the just transition element. So uh, that are my, my remarks. I, I do think that uh, I think uh, um, we just this report is a very important uh, contribution. The language of this report, I think can be uh, really adopted by many central bankers. And, and I hope that that will be the development we will, we will see. Well, thank you, Laurence, and uh, really good to hear those uh, those thoughts. And again, thank you for your partnership uh, in in uh, from the ECF and making this report a, a reality. So, Dirk, um, your your thoughts really uh, follow that, as they say. Um, so, Dirk, over to you for your your remarks. Thank you. Well, thank you, Nick, and uh, thank you for the invitation. And um, I want to congratulate the three authors um, on an excellent report on the movement to net zero. 
and the involvement of central banks and, and supervisors. And what I really like is that it is clearly pinching on the secondary mandate, because I've been in legal conferences and let's be clear, it is not a major issue for price stability. It is really the secondary mandate. So let's be clear on that. So I like that. Um, for the sake of time, I have two points to make. To make. And the first one is uh, which Saladat already mentioned. You have a movement to net zero by 2050. Everybody's making these. China makes it for 2060. And the court in The Hague has said to uh, Shell, nice that you have a target, but your transition plan is not credible. So we tell you to do more. And I think that that's exactly um, summarizing the need. Targets are only useful if we have pathways. And I would, so you build up clean, but you downsize at the same time fossil. You have to do both sides of the coin. And I would say we need annual milestones because most plans have an increase in the next five years and then a decrease. That's not credible at all. So annual milestones for a decreasing starting tomorrow. The good news is the Bloomberg task force and uh, uh, a new IFRS rules will require uh, disclosure. So the actual emissions can be checked. And then we need to check financial institutions have to do it. And uh, the comment, the question of Alex uh, Lehman, my colleague at Broekel, yes, we have to do all supervisors, not only banking, but also uh, pensions, insurance, and, and non-bank uh, financial intermediaries so across the board, otherwise we get just a shift. And I have one recommendation for, uh, for Nick, for the LSE. Um, your colleague Simon Dietz is uh, doing the Transition Pathway Initiative. And I would recommend to put the financial sector in as a new one so that you can check whether the financial sector is one and a half degree aligned. That would be really great service if, uh, if that's feasible. Then my second point, um, central banks and supervisors have a, th a tendency to think a risk. They're almost trained to be uh, risk averse and that you always see a problem when you walk on the street. And, um, and I think I'm a, a finance person. If we talk about net zero, that means funding, moving away from fossil and moving to low carbon technologies. That's an allocation role. That's the primary role of the financial system. So I would say, let's be clear about that. Risk is only a tool to avoid unnecessary losses. Um, so this is about allocation. And then how bring your allocation to the central bank mandate? Uh, Nick asked me to be specific. First of all, uh, all economists know that monetary policy is uh, allocational. And at the LSE, I learned from Charles Couthard that central banks are not for profit. So risk is not a consideration in the monetary policy operations apart from taking a haircut, of course. So it is allocational. Admit to it and admit that we want to move, allocate to lower carbon uh, and then be honest about it. Because otherwise we have fussy discussions about risk while we mean allocation. The second thing is, Supervisors have started to look at business models um, of the clients of financial institutions. So they are worried that uh, banks, pension funds, insurance companies are financing companies with an outdated business model. That's a basic source of credit risk. So thinking about the climate, you want to see whether the bank, the pension fund is checking the business model of the clients, whether that's aligned with one and a half or two degrees, or whether that is behind. That's transition preparedness. That's again about the future. And that's why uh, some uh, already uh, stressed it, there's the need for scenarios, but then credible scenarios. And on that note, I would like to, to ask uh, to finish, and that we update ourselves from uh, the risk perspective, which is really scaring everybody and normally it won't put people in action. But 
try to be positive, and that is also far nicer if you work on it. So I would say let's recognize it as allocational and let's uh, get on with it with annual milestones to be checked and not far away plans uh, which are pie in the sky. So uh, uh, let's what the, the court did in The Hague, let's take that serious uh, for ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Doug. Really, really, really interesting. And I think this focus on the on the near term is really important. That was one of the themes I think came out of scenarios being essential, but actually we know that the reallocation this decade is going to be critical. So we were talking about, which I think is something which is much more within the regime and culture of prudential supervisors, actually what banks and, and, and funds and so on are thinking about in the next three, five years in the business cycle. Um, that actually, yes, 2050, but bringing that forward to to sort of uh, near term action is, is going to be what's uh, what's needed. We've got lots of questions. Thank you all for, for those. I think we've sort of touched on a couple of them. The just transition point. I think that was a sort of an, an analytical point that we were trying to make. So thanks, Uli, for asking asking that. Uh, we've got a question in, in from uh, Indonesia as as well, um, and also price stability. I think uh, we touched on that a little bit, uh, Laurence. Um, so one of the things that I think is an interesting question, um, the, the two interesting questions that come through um, from, from this, one is actually uh, about actually are there potential downsides um, uh, in terms of, um, of this ship to net zero uh, central, central banking? Um, so is, is there, are there risks um, in terms of uh, taking this approach? I just wanted to get, I think it's Alex uh, Lehman's question. So thanks, Alexander. Um, so could net zero and bank supervision be counterproductive? Banks, uh, could they sort of be shifting assets and, and, and so on? So maybe some just some thoughts on that. We, we don't all have to answer that, but I think that's an interesting one. I mean, we, we all, I suppose, thinking about central bank supervisors, always thinking about unintended consequences. I think there's a consensus this is an important area, but are there any potential unintended consequences? Who would like to take that? We could just have one or two hands for that if anybody has any thoughts. Dirk, thank you. Uh, th thanks, uh, Alex, um, and that's a great question. I alluded al already a little bit at it. I think the Financial Stability Board is quite clearly under Mark Carney and now uh, also under the new leadership, looking at non-bank financial intermediation because risks are shifted to markets and then they are nowhere. So I, I think you're completely right that we have to have a financial system-wide view. I think that's recognized in macro prudential. Whether it is feasible is number two. I see as the main risk that we move too slow because the International Energy Agency said very clearly there is no scope for new exploration of uh, oil and gas. Still, major oil companies are doing that. That's where the risk is, that you uh, have a stranded asset uh, on your balance sheet, not that we move too fast. So I would see the main risk is that you move too slow and that the financial institutions, although they do a bit of clean energy, they didn't downsize the fossil fuel holdings uh, because they just didn't look carefully at it and then uh, kept the, the stranded assets of Ben Caldecott. So I see that as the main risk. Great. Maybe you'd like to add to that, Laurence, any thoughts on, on this in terms of, because I think obviously people do raise these, these, these issues. I, uh, I, I totally agree with Dirk. The, the problem is, uh, and that an argument that comes often, no, if we withdraw too fast from the stranded asset, then we create a, a supply crisis or, or a demand crisis, whatever, depending on how it managed. But anyway, we are losing capital, which is still invested and many represent sometime a major part of the equity uh, or, or is in the portfolio or is in the portfolio of all financial actors, by the way. But if we stick to that, that will be a big, uh, you know, you, you just, if you prolong that at that conservative attitude, then you will have a major shock. Mm -hmm. And the shock will be, you, you will not be able to respond to that shock. So uh, we have to really repeat that. That's why the elements on the milestone, what are the milestones, who is doing the job? That is a job where regulators, and when listening to you, I'm even more convinced that the regulators has to be this role of checking, that, that really we don't go for that risk. 
And I'm very happy of the comment. I, I would just build on that because I do think we, for the moment, there is nobody checking, really. Huh? Mm -hmm. There is nobody checking. And, and that, that's a major risk. So agree, Double, doubling down. Great. Could I come to you, Soledad? Um, you said you had some further thoughts on specifics. Um, and maybe- this, On this, I also I want to compliment that it's really Please. important. I mean, the, the, one of the biggest downsides I see is, or risks, is uh, developing countries. I mean, mm -hmm. they don't have the, the tools, they don't have the funds. So it's absolutely important that the developed world help the, developing countries and I think that's crucial because otherwise I mean we will, I mean this is a global thing if just one part of the of, of the world doesn't fight against climate change then we are all of us lost so this is absolutely important and uh, the downside uh, consequences that they can, they can have in terms of employment and production and so on, I mean they it needs some really international cooperation. Yeah. Yeah. It's not so much on central bank and central banks too. I mean, I for for making the role the role, no. And uh, as the the report said and uh, Ulrich said in his presentation, but mostly from from the other uh, from the other part, of, not not only central banks but financial international institutions, for instance, has to to help a lot on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, very good. We got a question in actually from Heru Rayadian from the Bank Indonesia, which is interesting. And I think if we just think about the, the challenge, uh, the EU peaked uh, carbon emissions in 1979. And so there's a sort of almost 70 year from, from peak uh, to, to zero. And I think for some of the major emerging economies, that sort of shift is obviously been, going to necessarily be um, uh, much faster. We are actually coming into the uh, the final final landing zone for this session. Um, uh, it's been fantastic so far, and uh, we should probably have had a longer session. So I would like really to be thinking about next steps. Um, that I think we've had some good discussions, some good um, questions, some good uh, pushback, added recommendations. Thank you, Soledad, and and so on. But really, where do we go from here in this sort of moment, particularly the next? six months. If I could start with you, Laurence, because I know you have to head off, I think, uh, in a couple of minutes, but maybe particularly a sort of a, a couple of action points about where we can achieve sort of, op, sort of practical change, I think, in the, in, in, the, in the coming months. Thank you. Yeah, basically, uh, as Soledad said, it's not easy to know what to do. And, uh, and so taking some examples, uh, digging on uh, on some, maybe some case studies of uh, how, how uh, a central bank can achieve that and what the tools are needed to, to elaborate on the, the, you know, as a toolkit and, and how to do it. As I would like to give a, a, another strong, simple message before leaving, leaving you. Um, there is, of course, a big international discussion now that U.S. are coming back to the, to, to mm -hmm. the table about what would this regulation would look like. Uh, and I, I would like to insist on, we have made a lot of thinking and progress and definition within the EU community in a way. And I just urge that we stick to that, that we, we I know uh, the US concept will not be the same. There will be of course discussion with developing countries, that's fine and normal. Because again, that matter of definition for uh, everyone to understand the macroeconomic of this discussion and how to handle it, because there are different contexts. But I think we should not just want to, in a way, lose the, the, the acquis that we did with all this conversation and definitions, because others are lagging behind for many good reasons we can perfectly understand. So cooperation on one side, as Soledad said, mm -hmm. and on the other side, I think we, like many times in climate action, we have to stick with the progress we made and, and hope that others will finally recognize that the taxonomy was you know, a good result and that the type of regulation, the mandate is very important. On the Monday, by the way, you see that on US, we will probably find a, a, a similar concept and even very strong on their side. But on, for example, the taxonomy or the type of disclosure, it will not be the same. But I think we should conserve the, the intellectual capital and the political mm -hmm. capital who have gained so far. So just wanted to say that I think we should mm -hmm. study. Very good. Thank you so much, Lawrence, and thanks again for joining us. I appreciate that. Solid, you're, you're just sort of close, closing thoughts in a, in, a, in a few seconds, if you could. 
We can't hear you, Soledad, sorry. Okay, my finger didn't work, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> well, I think that uh, the next steps for the euro system, mostly, uh, I think is to have a more active role in monetary policy and, uh, and on the, the elaboration of a plan as the first, uh, the first recommendation says, although I am not so sure it should say so in the mission statement, because I think that the mission statement should include, for, of course, the secondary mandate, the secondary objective that is not there now. And if it does, if it's there, because the, the mission statement is very general. So if it says price stability and the secondary objective, then implicitly all the all this stuff is there. But uh, and in terms of that, on the action plan and uh, uh, making more clear what uh, it's gonna do and monetary policy. I am really, uh, I mean, it's, it's a pity that we don't have more time to elaborate that, but I see the movement I mean, among, uh, among governors. I mean, all of them uh, uh, recognize the effects on price stability and balance sheet and transmission of monetary policy and so on. And some of them, eh, not all of them, but some of them also recognize that following the market neutrality principle for the purchasing of corporate uh, bonds is not very very good principle eh, now because it I mean it leads to a bias so towards high intensive uh, sectors and then because of the mispricing of the market then eh, it increases the risk of the portfolio the ECB's portfolio plus is against EU policies because with this bias, I mean, if you I mean, you enhance the, the the mispricing by doing so, then at the end you are against the, against your the the EU principle. I mean, the EU policy uh, commitment. But and then I I am on, on the opinion of uh, that is optimistic of a uh, governor of Bank of France, Bilawa, that said the other day in the Green. Swan summit that he hopes that when the uh, conclusion of the uh, review of the uh, monetary policy strategy comes comes in fall, eh, we will see well more modeling, more models, more research, which is very important, more transparency, asking uh, uh, our counterparties. Uh, disclosure, which is a very, a really, really, I think it's a very, very uh, powerful tool, and greening somehow the, uh, the the purchases. Although this is limited because the the um, I mean the purchases are limited in time and in quantity, and it's tricky to do so. Uh, it seems that uh, better than going from uh, to a exclusion. Met, uh, uh, way of doing it is better a uh, so might make a way that of tilting it eh? gradually tilting it uh, but I think I mean so I at the end I am of the opinion that a, a lot will come next fall very good thank you um, I, guys, <laughs> I don't know if I was clear because I, I am in such a hurry to because yeah. I know that the time is running yeah, well, uh, normally we have a guillotine which chops off all our heads on the hour. The guillotine hasn't fallen yet, so maybe um, if I can uh, ask our participants to stay, because I think I'd like us to hear from Dirk and Simon and Ole, then I'll wrap up. If we can maybe just give some closing remarks, but if you could keep it brief, watch out for the guillotine because it may fall. So Dirk, first to you, and then Simon and Ole, then we'll wrap up. So thank you. Yeah, I will do my, uh, mine is one minute. Uh, three items, the climate fund of 100 billion, we have to fill that and that's uh, solving Soledad's issue because I fully agree with her, if we have solved it, but we didn't solve the developing countries, then we didn't solve anything. So do what we have said. After fall, the European Parliament has approved the ECB strategy, get started in January 2022 with mm -hmm. reducing the carbon bias in monetary policy. Don't do further modeling, but just do it. Yeah. And third, mm -hmm. In the SREP, put the annual milestones for the transition pathways of financial institutions. 
so then in the strap you can give banks higher capital uh, if if they don't have clear emissions and reductions right thank Thanks. you Matt. i do like this idea of um, annual milestones and also i think focusing on what needs to happen in 2022 as well i think sometimes we can be obsessed with uh, cop and so on that's very good thanks Dirk. well i'm going to come to you um your your rapid fire conclusions and what next well, I'll just pick up on the developing emerging market world. I think um, clearly we, we need uh, much greater support and of course on the fiscal side, but I also think on the um, uh, analysis side and so on. So, so I think there's a major role for the IMF, World Bank, multilateral development banks, but also uh, really um, uh, kind of peer-to-peer -peer support and, 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 and capacity building. And again, I do think actually uh, we also need to need to build capacities in academia in in, in all these countries uh, that directly feeds into the work uh, of, of central bank supervisors thank you thank you Ali, so much there's a bird singing somewhere i don't know where it is but uh, nice to welcome you as well um simon over to you um yes thank you nick maybe just to pick up also what what um Danae's question um yeah I, I think it will be very interesting to see where central banks are moving next as, as, as we are increasingly realizing that this is actually quite, quite a big task to achieve this transition by 2050, and that this will bring a huge structural change for the economy. And I mean, historically, to, to, to also bring in Charles Goodhart again, um, we have seen that central banks were always very quick to, 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 th to throw all their, all, their, all their approaches out of the window once there was a, a, a huge crisis. So I think that will be very interesting to see whether central banks, once we realize how, how big this and, and, and significant this transition will have to be, whether central banks also um, will, will return to a, to a much um, more involved approach. Well, thank you all again. Thanks to Laurence in her absence. Uh, again, thanks to the European Climate Foundation for supporting the research that went into this. I think maybe in a in a homage to um, to Laurence, clearly within the Paris Agreement there is the the famous Article Two One C, a commitment of governments to make financial flows consistent with low carbon and climate resilient development, and and I think sort of thinking through now, so five six years on, uh, the role clearly of finance ministries that was the big cog, cog in the the picture. Uh, that Simon showed, but also central banks, the role in delivering that clear commitment of making financial flows uh, consistent. I think in terms of the international debate we've had, particularly about uh, developing and emerging economies, there are some interesting uh, maybe spillover effects of thinking about a net zero financial system in the EU. If we think about the the, the assets of uh, banks and investors that are headquartered and in, in the EU, clearly these are these have global implications. These are often global assets and so on. So there will be necessarily um, impl implications and we need to make sure that these have positive implications for that uh, scale up in capital um, uh, in, in developing and emerging economies. So I would like to thank you all. Um, this work will be continuing. Um, we will continue to work on the themes around net zero, climate neutral, central banking, both in the EU, uh, but also hopefully in, in, in other parts of the world, in the US, emerging economies and so on. I'd like to thank our remaining uh, panelists, uh, Soledad Nunes, uh, Dirk Schumacher, my co-authors Uli Voltz and, and Simon Decker. And thank you all to you for your questions. I hope you found that they, some of them were answered and uh, let's continue the discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you and thanks Nick. <laughs>